will get your questions answered. I am recording this session like we have in previous sessions so that we can post it up and share it with other members at the Timpani Center. Um, so with that, I'll hand it over to Tu and go ahead and get started. All right, thanks, Sabine, for a very thorough introduction. Um, I'm very excited for our presentation today, which is gonna be vegetarian cooking. So today we will talk about the benefit of vegetarian cooking to your health, your budget, and the environment. And other topic we will cover today um, will be how to store, how to prepare fruits and vegetables. And at the end, we will introduce to you a full vegetarian meal from appetizer to very delicious dessert delivered to you by our team of students from the community nutrition class. Uh, so let's get started. Okay. So water and vegetables, I would like to pass this on to Janine to answer that this questions. Hey everyone, I'm happy to see some of you guys again. Um, so to start off with vegetarian cooking, right? What are in vegetables? Why vegetables? Why are they so great for us? Um, so first thing is that they are full of phytochemicals or I will also call them phytonutrients. The way to help remember what these are is that phyto in uh, Greek means plant. So plant nutrients, plant chemicals, right? And um, for phytochemicals, they can be distinguished uh, really by unique colors, aromas, and flavors, um, as well as uh, some of these components in phytochemicals, which are fiber and antioxidant, which we'll go over um, in a few more slides. And they are also alternative sources to animal proteins, as you can see in the picture. These are some of the uh, types of vegetables and plants that can be uh, sources of protein instead of animal protein, which are easier to prepare and digest and um, helps us stay full longer. Next slide, please. Okay, so I will also be going over uh, certain functions of phytonutrients. There are many kinds, but we'll just highlight some of the ones we think are a little more useful. So they boost our immune system. So help us to prevent us from getting sick. Um, these phytochemicals do this by activating or stimulating our immune system to help prevent illness or infections. An example of this is antioxidants. Um, very powerful for us. It helps prevent harmful reactions. These harmful reactions are known as oxidative reactions um, that occur in our bodies. Um, as well as inhibiting damaged cells from reproducing. So antioxidants will help protect us from free radicals and signal a damaged cell to destroy themselves um, to stop potential inflammations, diseases, and multiplying of the damaged cells. Um, third, they help regulate hormones. This helps to keep our hormones balanced, which is what regulates all of our body's functions. And last but not least, here uh, we'll highlight fiber. Um, this uh, fiber only comes from plant foods, which is a carbohydrate that the body can't digest, um, which helps in digestion and bowel movements, as well as helping regulate the body's use of sugars. Oh, two, you're muted. Okay, here I go. So thanks, Janine, for talking about what is what are in what are in vegetables and the function of vegetables. We might not see the benefits of fruits and vegetable right at the time we eat it. And in fact, there are vegetables that are really hard to enjoy because of the taste. Um, however, by looking at the word on a slide that I put in red. We see a lot of the word reduce, lower, or prevent. So we can kind of see the trend of how vegetables and fruit benefit our health 
So the health benefits of fruits and vegetables in older population are to reduce risk of mortality among older adults, reduce the likelihood of chronic diseases, lower the risk of type 2 diabetes, prevent against the onset of cognitive impairment like the development of Alzheimer or dementia, um, prevent falls and walking disability, and uh, prevent other geriatric, aka aging, associated condition. And most of all, uh, fruits and vegetables can uh, be a prevention of bone loss in both men and women. And throughout the years, hundreds and thousands of scientific research and many efforts of people that are followed throughout the lifetime have proved that the health benefit of fruits and vegetables are very high among older population. So now that we talk about the benefits of fruits and vegetables, let's look at the situation of vegetable consumption in the United States. So according to the CDC, just one in 10 adults meet the federal fruits and vegetable recommendation. Roughly half of adults in the United States suffer from one or more preventable chronic diseases relate to poor diet and physical inactivities. According to the Dietary Guideline for Americans, um, luckily they give us a very clear ideal portion for fruits and vegetables, which are two and a half cups of vegetables and two cups of fruit per day to maintain a healthy diet and a appropriate portion of fruits and vegetables per day. So how is not the only advantage of vegetarian cooking, but the economy and environment also benefit from uh, vegetarian cooking. So for budget wise, looking at an overall price a day for vegetarian cooking compared to when you plan to have some animal proteins, the cost of plant-based cooking can be much cheaper than uh, when meat proteins included, um, like this picture right here, you can clearly see that if you include plant-based meals that contain like rice, corn, wheat, soybeans, the price are much cheaper than when you include like chicken or pork or beef. And for environmental wise, a vegetarian diet requires two and a half times less the amount of land needed to grow food compared to a meat-based diet. Another aspect is greenhouse gases. Greenhouse gas is the earth atmosphere that trap heat. So when this gas become excessive, it is believed to cause global warming. So the chart right here, um, this chart right here, they do a comparison between people with different type of diets, varies from vegan diet, vegetarian, to low meat eaters and high meat eaters. So looking at a person who follow a vegan diet compared to a person who follow a high meat diet, we can see that the person who follow vegan diet emits 6.5 pounds of greenhouse gas emission a day compared to a person who consume a high meat diet. They, their diet overall a day will emit about 16 pounds of gas emission. So we can clearly see the impact of uh, vegetarian diet compared to meat protein diet to the environment. And we have been uh, going through several slides. Do you have any questions at this point so far? 
I'm sorry to have to ask this, but the greenhouse gas emissions, yeah. is that the emissions resulting from the production of the food or the emissions of the person? <laughs> I, I solely believe it's the emission of the production of the food. And I honestly haven't looked into whether the emission of human affected is going to be a very interesting study. I hope someone will do that. <laughs> and it's interesting to know. But thanks, Scott. So let's move on to our next slide, which is um, seasonal fruits and vegetables. So another amazing thing about fruit and vegetables is that they are cheaper, they, they are fresher, and they are more flavorful than when they are in season. So when shopping for local produce, especially at a farmer market, and when you see seasonal food that are in good condition, since less transportation are needed to transport these fruits and vegetables from a further distance, and less transportation also means that it will be less pricey. So seasonal fruits and vegetables are also cost effective. And for those of you who use CalFresh in California, which is a great federal program that really advocate healthy shopping and healthy cooking, um, if you have that, you can check with the from a market vendor to see if they accept cowfish. So how to store vegetables and fruit? Every kind of fruits and vegetables need different methods of storage to maintain the best quality. And it's, it's very useful that you are being mindful about um, what kind of fruits and vegetable that you shopped that you have a different kind of storage so that you can maintain the freshness and prevent vegetable spoilage. So for example, when we need certain fruit to ripe, like if you buy a bag of unripe avocados or green bananas, you would wanna leave them on countertop so they can ripe instead of putting them in a refrigerator. Um, on the other hand, there are fruits that you need to make sure they maintain the moisture and you want to put it in the fridge as long as you get back from the grocery stores and those fruits and vegetables are like berries, grapes, lemon, beans, broccoli, etc. And there are vegetables that you can store in a pantry you don't need to leave them on, on a countertop. You don't need to leave them in a fridge that take a lot of space. And those vegetables that can store in the pantries are um, onions, garlic, potatoes, and squash. And lastly, there is the freezer. So when you want to store fruits and vegetables for a longer period of time, um, you can store it in the freezer. For example, I usually store frozen fruits for my smoothies in the freezer or a lot of people they blanch vegetables and store it in the freezer for later use and one of the very popular vegetables that being blanched and stored in the freezer are broccoli all right so just like storage preparing and cooking methods uh, varies by the type of fruits and vegetables you have. So there are veggies that require less preparation than others. For example, if you buy some cherry tomato, you only need to rinse it and then you can eat them individually compared to when you buy like a bigger tomato, then you need to wash it and you need to chop it in cubes or you need to slice it. So cherry tomato have less preparation than regular baked tomatoes. So according to this, is, is recommend that when you go shopping, plan it in your head that whether you have more time to cook today or you have less time so you can buy vegetable that 
require less preparation versus when you have more time, then you wanna buy vegetables that require more preparation time. So this is all about planning, um, planning ahead for your shopping that make your cooking much easier. And for the method of cooking, so cooking methods are varies between vegetables. So there are four major cooking methods that people believe to retain the most nutritional values of vegetables. And those are roasting, crock pot or instant pot, pan fry, stir fry, and steam or microwave. So each of these methods give you a different flavor and texture for your vegetables and also on a timely manner. Some of the cooking methods take longer time than others. For example, if you cook vegetable in a crock pot or instant pot and trying to make a stew, it will take longer than you pan fry your vegetables on a pan. So also about this, it's all about planning. If you have more time, then you can make some stew. If you have less time, then you can stir fry some vegetable on, on a pan. So it's take much shorter time. And um, planning ahead make your cooking much easier and you can enjoy cooking um, and make your own meal. So now that I have wrapped up about the preparing vegetables methods, I would like to pass on to Scott and he will talk about meatless proteins. So before we get into the proteins, just to piggyback on what Tu said about time, if you find yourself with a lot of extra time, something that I do is I will blanch vegetables ahead of time. And then I will have containers of blanched vegetables that I can use throughout the week. Um, so that when I need them and I may have zero time at all, I can grab it and take it with me. Uh, I can eat them cold if I want, but just to prepare ahead of time for times that you don't have um, the, the time or resources to be able to cook those. So when it comes to meatless protein, there's one, one main idea that I would, I would like to get across. And that is the fact that most all animal proteins are complete proteins, meaning it has all 22, not just all 22 amino acids, but the nine essential amino acids that our body cannot make. And if you are not getting all 22 amino acids, including the nine essential amino acids, then your body cannot um, completely repair muscles, um, utilize the protein to make hormones and enzymes and cholesterol and all the different things, the, the cell walls, um, all the things that amino acids and proteins are needed for, you have to have all 22 amino acids. So the, there is an idea called complementary proteins. And that's when you take two different things, uh, two different foods and put them together to create a complete protein. And typically it will be a uh, like a, a vegetable and a starch or a legume and a starch. Now, there are a lot of things that in the course of 2000 years, foods that have gone really well together, uh, that it turned out formed a complete protein and people didn't realize why it made them healthy. But now we know that it's a complete protein. Things like beans and rice, um, hummus dip and pita bread, uh, peanut butter jelly, or peanut butter and bread. So those things don't have to go together to form the complete protein. You could mix and match your uh, vegetables and your starches to make a complete protein. But if you are going to experiment with an all vegetable diet, you wanna make sure that you are getting a variety of vegetables. So even if you don't do add the starch with the vegetable, if you're getting a variety of vegetables, you can almost guarantee that you will eventually get all nine essential amino acids and therefore your body will be able to use those amino acids to rebuild and all the things that your body uses protein for. 
there are a couple of plant proteins that are complete. And that would be quinoa is a complete protein as is shown on that slide. Uh, buckwheat, hemp seed, chia seeds, which um, you, I guarantee you've seen chia seeds and may not even realize that there's some kombuchas or beverages that you'll see at the grocery store that have these little pearls, these, these like eyes, maybe look like fish eggs that are looking at you. And it's this little seed that when immersed in liquid absorbs the liquid and this gelatinous sphere um, forms outside of the seed and they become a lot bigger and they, they feel, they feel weird going down. I, I enjoy them. They're, they're packed in nutrients um, and it has a complete protein. So you can add that to water, let it sit for an hour and it is, and just drink it. Um, and that's all you have to do. Soy is another complete protein. However, as Soy has estrogen mimicking compounds. So it's something that I stay away from as a male. Uh, I don't want a lot of soy, not to mention, I just don't really enjoy tofu. But just to know that there are a lot of vegetables that will give you a complete protein. And if you don't have the complete protein, make sure you're getting a variety of vegetables so that you will get all nine amino acids. Do you have anything else to talk about this slide, Scott? Because I'm not sure if you want to change slide. Uh, well, the, this slide is, is just showing a number of different items that have proteins. So to go along with my point of bottom left, you're going to have some starches. And uh, bottom right, you have your nuts. All of these things, mix them in combination. If you are making a salad with your kale and spinach, add some pecans or some cashews or some almonds. You can toss in quinoa. I, I mean, quinoa and um, wild arugula with almonds and cranberries or chickpeas. I mean, you are guaranteeing that you are going to get your essential amino acids and you're getting a complete protein. So that's kind of the, the gist of the slide is to mix and match, put everything together. If you're gonna do a predominantly vegetarian diet, just get a wide variety of vegetables. Don't only eat broccoli or only eat cauliflower because it's not gonna give you, uh, you're not gonna get the benefits of eating um, the variety of vegetables. Yeah, I agree with the idea of when we do vegetarian cooking, it's just very important and also very helpful for us to combine different types of vegetables and different types of plant-based proteins because a lot of people think about vegetarian cooking as boring because you because people might think that you can only eat one kind of vegetables, but when you mix a lot of kind of vegetables together as well as throwing in some nuts, throwing in some grains and some plant-based dressing, you have a much more flavorful meals as well as what Scott mentioned about the incomplete proteins. But when you mix more kind of vegetable together, plant-based together, then you will have a more of complete proteins in your meals. So that's a very good point. And Janet, I have to say that I cannot answer your question about vegetables suitable for gout with any um, with any intelligence. If if I were to try to answer that, I, I probably wouldn't be helpful. I have, I have no idea. Um, Janet, I just uh, posted in the chat box, the Mayo Clinic has some really excellent resources and dietary suggestions for those that suffer with gout. Um, you do want to stay away from things like asparagus and other veg similar vegetables that are high in purines. Um, because those may aggravate your gout symptoms. And you're welcome. <laughs> I just wanted to add to that too for gout. Um, most vegetables are okay. Um, so yeah, more of the dark greens you want to not consume so much of. Um, this is from family experience, at least for my own. 
uh, answers, um, as well as avoiding cherries and things like that that are high in purines, but things in high in vitamin C are good for you, so. Thank you. <laughs> A question? Yes, please. And the question is during the ahead of time preparation, and sometimes we may buy things already cut up at the stores and bring it home. Do we lose very much nutrients in these vegetables and when you prepare it like one week at a time? And the things that you might buy at Whole Food already prepared and it's already been cut. Um, I think it depends on the vegetable. So things, you may lose some of the fiber if the fiber is, a lot of the fiber is in the peel and it's already been peeled and chopped for you. Um, but as far as the rest of the nutrient content in there, it should be fairly similar, if not the same as your, if you were to buy the whole vegetable, not yet chopped and prepared. Um, it's more in the cooking methods that you may, like Tu was talking about, that you may lose some of the nutrients, like if something, if you are uh, boiling a vegetable, then you would definitely want to retain and use the, the water that you boiled it in. Like when you boil um, broccoli, for example, or other green vegetables and the water is green when you're done, that water has a lot of the nutrients, some of the nutrients in it as well. Can I also add to that? Um, for things that are already pre-prepared, it's not that they'll have loss of nutrients, but make sure they're not adding anything. So they might add stuff to their own uh, products. Like let's say like olives, they'll add their own olive oil and salt and all of that. So. Good, good ways to utilize that liquid um, for me are to use, let's use the example of the broccoli water. I will use that in soup or I will add that to a smoothie because my smoothie is going to need uh, some liquid. So instead of just adding tap water, I will add the potato water or broccoli water. Um, also, keep in mind that a lot of the nutrients for vegetables are found in the skin. So if you're getting something pre-prepared that is skinned before it's chopped, you're losing a lot of the nutrients that you're eating the vegetable for. And if you are preparing it yourself, uh, like a potato, a lot of the nutrients are in the skin of that potato. So if you just eat the inside of the potato and not the skin, then you're not getting all of the nutrients. Thank you. I was just going to chime in as well, because I think um, another part of that question is how long can you keep fruits and vegetables maybe? And so we hear local, right? And visit your farmer's market. And um, part of that is true. The fresher the vegetable, obviously the more nutrition it will have, but that doesn't mean that you lose a ton of nutrition, right? So you don't want to keep your vegetables forever. You do want to try to buy in quantities that you're going to go through um, so that they stay fresh. Um, I think that that's another part of the question. So try to buy what you can use within, um, you know, a week if you're shopping on a weekly basis, or maybe this is where you can utilize one of those CSAs and they can drop off a box of produce every week. So you have fresh produce, right? So it really, um, you do wanna to try to go through it as fast as you can, but having multiple options so that you're consuming fr fruits and vegetables on a regular basis is important too. So that's where having a bag of frozen, frozen vegetables in your freezer for days when you don't have fresh at home or even having canned um, gives you the option to include fruits and vegetables when you don't have fresh options available. Um, Jennifer, Jennifer, I see your hand up. Did you have a comment or a question that you wanted to add? Yeah, I would like to ask about, uh, you, you mentioned the estrogen mimicking uh, proteins in soy. And um, that's one of the foods that I try to like, I just arbitrarily came up with like a once a month kind of thing like I do with beef of not to overdo it. Uh, but I was recently visiting one of my friends who's a vegan and she's very concerned about developing breast cancer and she's been eating um, almost every meal has a soy based protein in it. And so I was wondering if there are any recommendations on like the dosages or how much you should be having every week to avoid getting into that cancer risk category. Well, I, um, go ahead. Um, Scott. 
I, I was I was just going to say I would not necessarily be the best one to answer from the female perspective. Um, males and females, we all need estrogen to a certain extent and guys is much less. So I try to stay away from it because I don't want my body to not produce, but think that it's getting estrogen. So I would just add to that, that there's a lot of mixed research out there on this topic. And so, yes, it's different for males versus females. It's also one of those things, there isn't a lot of evidence that suggests that soy necessarily causes cancer, but for certain people who have cancer. So if you have breast cancer, for example, you do want to know what type of breast cancer you have because some are more um, reactive to soy than others. So for depending on what type of breast cancer you have, you may want to avoid soy at that point. And women who are postmenopausal or premenopausal may react differently to soy as well. So it really depends on what life stage you're in. Um, I would go back to the fact that you want to enjoy all foods in balance and moderation. So maybe finding other foods to enjoy other than soy. So using legumes, using lentils, using beans, using other plant sources of protein um, and, and putting those into the meal plan in, in a variety of different ways um, might be helpful for your friend as well. So not, not necessarily just relying on soy. So if you enjoy tofu, then maybe drink almond milk so that you're not drinking soy milk on top of tofu. Right. So um, I think there's ways to balance out the intake. And there's also a, a lot of different soy products available. So tofu is one. Um, edamame is another form of soy, right? It's the soybean. So you're getting a different type of soy. But there's fermented soy products as, as well. And there's a lot of benefits from eating those um, fermented products. So um, I think the answer would be that. Um, if your friend has concerns about it, I would see a registered dietitian and maybe look at the overall meal patterns, um, but then also look at um, adding variety into the diet so that we're not maybe necessarily relying on soy as the only form of protein. Thank you. Scott, um, you were talking about meatless proteins the last couple of slides. Um, there was no mention of beyond meat or impossible meat. Um, do you have any comment on that? As someone's thinking about a vegetarian cooking and experimenting? I probably should not comment on, on those. Um, it's something that I'm never going to eat. And if, if someone wants to eat it, then they are more than welcome to. Uh, but if I, I would probably say something that would offend somebody. So you can you can certainly get all Sorry. you can certainly get all of your protein from other sources and not the fake meats that are made to taste like meat. I also am not sure if there are a lot of studies to that have kind of broken down that to figure out if it's made to taste like meat. Sure, we have found some uh, some algaes or some fungi that have the umami properties that are able to give these things the meat-like flavor. Uh, but I wonder if there are artificial flavors added as well to make it taste just like chicken or to make it taste just like beef. Um, and if there are, that's not something that, that I would want. I would, I would like to add on to like the Beyond Meat and the Impossible Meat, like all the meat alternative hype on the market right now, um, even though it's it can be controversial, but I think there's one benefit that for people who want to transition between plant-based diet and meat diets, maybe it can be varies on a reason. Maybe it can be for medical reason that that might be it, and then people just cannot give up meat day day one day two, so that can be one of the benefit, but. Yeah, for, for those things that are innovative like that, they're probably opinions that we we need to respect both sides. <laughs> but I do know one, one interesting thing about Impossible and Beyond Me is that the color, the red color, pe how people said like there are fake blood in there. I, I know that it's made from beets. 
Um, just to add to this uh, alternative sources protein talks, I uh, just want to remind everyone to, if you are all for meat and you're like, oh, I don't need alternative sources, you can add. You can add both mixed animal and plant uh, protein sources. So you can have tofu and seafood or however you want to mix these. So you don't have to just choose one or the other in your meals. There's actually a new term for that. It's called flexitarian. Okay. So flexitarian means that um, you choose to eat vegetarian, but you also eat um, plant-based foods, or sorry, animal-based foods on occasion. So if you want to maybe eat less meat and incorporate more vegetables, you can choose to be flexitarian. Which just takes us back to the way that humans have eaten in entirety. Uh, we were never meant to eat plates full of meat. Um, it was supposed to be complementary to the rest of our food. Yeah, come back to portion size. We don't eat like we going to steak out every day. Every day. So the this nutrition students know that um, in my house, my husband has always had some unusual eating habits. They hear about it through my classes. He is now vegan. So in our house, we eat vegetarian or vegan several nights a week. And so we are trying more and more different products. In fact, we've had the Impossible Burger. And this last week, I tried the new Beyond Meat Brats. <laughs> My husband loves them, of course, because he can eat them and gets his protein option in. The kids and I will eat them, but we don't love them. So we tried the Brats and they were, as my son said, it was okay but I wouldn't eat it again. Um, so it's, I think really what you're up to. If you're a vegetarian or a vegan, I think they're great options on occasion, um, but looking to stay as, um, you know, I, I just prefer personally eating whole foods or regular <laughs> um, unprocessed foods. So it wouldn't be something that I would use um, on a daily basis, but on occasion, I think it can add interest into your meals. Jason says they're great in moderation. Yeah, I agree. Everything is good in moderation. <laughs> well, thank you for all the wonderful questions and insight. Uh, we have about 20 minutes left. So I would like to move on to our demo because we are very excited to show you guys. So like I said, we are gonna go full meal on the demo. So first I would like to show a video demos for our appetizer, which is uh, spring minestrone soup. This is from Tammy and it's gonna be around five minutes. So let me pull up the video. For the spring mushroom recipe, we'll need the following ingredients. Two large shallot, finely chopped. Two large um, celery stock, thinly sliced. Two tablespoons each of finely minced garlic and ginger. Eight cups of vegetable broth. One cup of noodles of your choice. Three four cups of broccoli, and three four cups of asparagus, smallly chopped, one cup of peas, and four cups of mixed baby green, baby kale, and baby spinach. I heat up the pot before putting in some canola oil to make sure the oil gets hot quickly. And then I add it in the shallot and celery. Mix them well together, then leave them on very low heat for around five minutes. After 
about five minutes. You see that the shell begins to turn brown and the color of the celery turns darker. That is fine for comics. Stir the mixture for around two minutes at very low heat before adding in the broth. After two minutes of stirring, the mixture should give out a very good aroma. And there's the time for us to put in the, uh, the vegetable broth. The recipe calls for eight cups of vegetable broth, but it totally depends on you, whether you want the whole eight cups of vegetable broth or like me, I would prefer to make it half water and half vegetable broth. Now I adjust the heat to medium high so I can bring the soup to simmer within three to five minutes. Once the soup begins to simmer, I'm going to add in the cup of noodle. And then let them cook for eight minutes at medium heat or however long that your choice of noodle requires. Once the noodles are soft and the water simmers, your soup is ready for the next step. So here I'm going to add in the cup of peas Job asparagus and broccoli. Then I'm going to leave them at medium high heat for another three minutes before adding in the last ingredients. Three minutes done. Last step. The mix baby kale and baby spinach. Everything stirred. Still at medium high heat. And voila. We have the spring maestro. Thanks, Tammy, for the, the demo. So one thing I noticed about the soup is that um, I don't think you add any salt in there, right? Yes, I did not uh, because I usually prefer um, less salty food. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, definitely when someone wants a little more flavorful you can add a little more salt and me personally I would add some vegetable bouillon mm -hmm. into my my food so that's another way to increase the taste yeah so I think this is a very good recipe for people who are on dash diet or low sodium diet and then I also see you add some spice like ginger so the when you want to incorporate more spice into your food, 
um, the flavor itself will make the food flavorful so that you can reduce the, the salt intake. So that can be a good tips on reduce sodium. Also in lieu of salt, squeeze half a lemon or a lime oh, yeah. in there. That too, the lamb will, will bring out the sodium flavor. All right, um, so let's move on to our entry, which is from Scott and Scott will demo, um, is it black beans patty burger? Correct, black right. bean quinoa. Black beans quinoa, quinoa, complete plant-based proteins. Here we go. And, and we will provide you with the recipe so you you don't need to worry about taking notes or anything. And also the video will be available as well. Hi guys, it's Scott. Today we are doing quinoa and black bean burgers. This recipe, we have two cups of cooked quinoa, two cans of black beans, a couple hot chilies, uh, some shredded cheese. You will use however much you want to make it taste as cheesy as you like it. We have about three quarter cup of cilantro, one bell pepper. You will need two eggs and salt and pepper. First thing we're gonna do, add some oil because I'm just going to saute the bell pepper. and the chilies. For just a little bit before I add them in and we make our burgers. All right, now the bell pepper and chilies are done. I'm gonna add them to the quinoa and cilantro. Also going in is the egg. the cheese, and the black bean. One of these cans I pureed, which is going to help to bind all of this together, and the other can is just drained and whole. We'll crack in some pepper. Pass in some salt. And then get to work. Bringing this all together. Now it's gonna go into the refrigerator to sit for 30 minutes or an hour. Just wanna let the juice help to, uh, help to make the quinoa absorb and stick and bind everything together. I'm gonna grab a handful of the mixture. Kind of, Pack it down little by little. I flatten it out and then use my thumb to mold around the side. To get a nice perfect patty. It was 25 minutes at 400 degrees. And you need to let them sit for a good 10 minutes, let them cool down. They will solidify and become stronger. And then enjoy. I like to, I really like to eat them with a little bit of sour cream.
Thanks, Scott. That looked very delicious and colorful. It looks like it has a um, kind of a Mexican flavor profile to it with the black beans and the cilantro and the peppers. It'd be good with maybe avocado or even guacamole as a topping, I would think. And keep in mind that uh, let your imagination run wild. You can make them taste. I, I personally just love if, if it's black beans, I'm going to want cilantro and hot chilies uh some cumin um things like this but i could just as easily have done the roasted red pepper and kalamata olives with feta cheese uh you and even uh cucumber i mean let your imagination run wild you can make it taste however you want there are no wrong answers uh, there's a question what type of chilies did you use uh well actually no name chilies. It, it was what I got at the Indian Bazaar. And they, uh, they looked like a cross between a Serrano and an Arbol. They were smaller than a Serrano, but bigger than a Arbol chili. Yeah, I, there's one Vietnamese restaurant I go to very often and they always give me that chili is very, very crunchy. But I don't, I don't, I don't know what kind of chili is that. Maybe I'll ask next time. I'll let you know, Jenny. <laughs> it would the if you're getting it at the Vietnamese restaurant, you're probably getting the Thai chili, which is similar yeah. similar size to the Arbol chili. It's just one is grown in Southeast Asia and one is grown in Latin America. Um, but if if you want an incredible condiment to put on your vegetables, I always have in my refrigerator a jar of fish sauce and a little bit of rice vinegar with uh, Thai chilies and some garlic. And oh, wow. you spread, spread that on whatever you want. And it, it's just incredible flavor. That is, that is impressive because I know very few people who love fish sauce because of the smell, but it just tastes very good. It, it's not something you drink. It's something you... Oh. <laughs> uh, it's something that you just enhance flavor with. Not even something for you to smell so often. It just gonna taste good. All right, thank you for your black bean burger. Um, I hope we have some time so I can introduce my dessert, which is chocolate zucchini cake. So give me one minute. I will set up my demo video here. Let's see, how do I do this? Um, stop sharing. Sabine, is there a way you can pin my demo video? I just did. Okay, is everyone seeing my screen? I'm not seeing it. Um, everyone seeing my demo video or my face? Your face. Okay. Hmm. Let's see. To maybe try reading. You'll need to, yeah, turn the sound off on the iPad when you log in. Uh, I don't oh, get okay. Let, okay, I just removed my pen. And then, then you can pin the iPad or your your second view. You can pin your second view. Um, oh. Or spotlight your second view. Do you see two demo? Yep. 
we see the demo, it's just not the main, the main video. Sabine, maybe you can highlight it if you have co-host. I pinned it so I can see it big, but I think that's just on my screen. Yeah, so everybody can pin it or... Um, oh, there. There you go. You all see it now? No. So two on your computer, not through the second screen, but through your main screen as host, you can go up and you can say um, spotlight and you can spotlight that video. There you go. Everybody yeah. see my screen right now? Not yet. Oh my goodness. I'm so sorry. Sue, can you make me host? Yes. Can you make me host? Let me see if I can spotlight them. Oh, I okay, okay. I see. All right, everyone seeing it? Oh, Should great. <laughs> Thanks for all your help. Does this teamwork? Okay. Perfect. All right, everyone oh, yeah. hearing me now? Yeah, yeah. There's an echo too. Sorry. Here. Hear me good? Yeah. All right. Great. So I would like to demo the chocolate zucchini bread. So this is a great way to use extra zucchini or vegetables you have in your fridge. So not only zucchini, if you have extra carrots, you can shred it and put it in this recipe as well. Um, so use half carrots, half zucchini, if you do have carrots. And so I skipped some of the steps just to save some time, but I leave the important point of why am I setting this up, which is I separate the dry ingredients and the wet ingredients right here. Um, one of the reason for baking uh, when you want to separate the dry and the wet ingredients when you are mixing it, uh, one of them that I learned personally is that um, if, you, if you don't separate them, let's say you make your dry ingredients and then you need to add an egg, and if you, add, if you crack an egg right into this bowl of dry ingredients and that egg happened to be spoiled, what's gonna happen? It's gonna spoil, it's gonna ruin the whole dry ingredients that you provide here. Because one time I did this mistake where I don't separate my wet and my dry ingredients and I crack an egg into my bowl of dry ingredients that I have here. And the egg turned out to be a neon color. I don't know if I leave it out for so long. I don't know what happened. I Google neon color egg. I don't know what happened with it. But definitely, you want to separate your wet and dry ingredients. And to make sure everything is fine, everything is good before you combine them. So the recipe will be provided you. But I just want to quickly introduce what is this in here. Um, in here, there's one, one four cup of all-purpose flour, one four cup of cocoa powder, one teaspoon of baking soda, one four teaspoon of salt, and half a teaspoon of cinnamon. And I, I use an, um, an egg whisk to mix everything. And then I have this bowl of dry ingredients. For this bowl of wet ingredients, I have one egg, one teaspoon of vanilla, three fourth cup of vegetables or canola oil. I use canola oil and I whisk um, with the egg, I whisk in um, about two fourth cup of sugar. And then I use an egg beater to whisk in and then this is what I have. This look very custardy. Um, 
Well, I would like to know, I, I, I learned one thing that when I whisk egg and vegetable oil, it's turned out to be a very custardy look. And I would like maybe someone explain it to me later on because with baking, you learn a lot of new things. And then right here, I have um, two cups of grated zucchini. I did this yesterday. Um, after I grate it, it's important for us to strain out the liquid because we don't want our cake to be super, super wet. So I strain it so it's, it's, it's not that juicy anymore and it's kind of dry right now. And then right here, I have one third cup of chocolate chips. And I use the semi-sweet chocolate chips from, uh, from Ghirardelli brand because I, I like my cake to be a little less sweet and it's totally optional. Okay, so we are gonna start mixing the dry ingredients into the wet ingredients and we will do it in three additions. So we don't wanna dump everything here because we might not have a well mixture. So I just wanna slowly add dry ingredients in here. Mix it and then start adding some more. Yesterday when I make this, I use an um, an egg whisk to mix this mixture and then it's it's much harder because it's stuck into the egg whisk. So it's better to use a big spoon like this. And then I'll add the rest of the dry ingredients. Mixed it. It almost looks like a brownie at this point. Sorry? I said it almost looks like a brownie at this point. Yeah, it is. This is exactly what I, I want to find that that work. It's, it's brownie. Yesterday when I mixed it, I was like, this looks like something edible. It's require a little bit of physical activities for your arm. All right, so we have mixed the dry and the wet ingredients together. Now I will add in the zucchini. So two cups of zucchini. And it's just amazing to imagine how much more fiber you get out of this cake compared to not adding in any zucchini. The zucchini will add a lot of moisture to this mixture. So don't worry just yet. It was look very dry and not very well mixed right now. So just need to keep mixing. I've done a similar recipe for my kids to camouflage getting a few extra vegetables in them. Grated carrot also works really well. So I'm excited about this recipe too. Thank you. I was going to say, it looks like a lot of zucchini at this point, but once you bake it, you cannot tell that there is zucchini in here. Yeah, I think I, I would be excited to add carrots next time I do this because I think carrots will add in more of the sweetness to the cake as well as the color. So we have like a green color and then we have an orange color. And you can see now compared to like two minutes earlier where everything is dry and powdery. Now with all the moisture from the zucchini, you can see how much liquidy it turns out. So 
notes look like look more like a paste right now. And then at this point, I would add in chocolate chips. This is my favorite ingredients. And two, you said you added a little bit of cinnamon into that dry ingredient mix. That's a great way to enhance. Yes, I did. And that's a great way to enhance the chocolate flavor. If anybody needs an, a chocolate enhancement, cinnamon or a little bit of coffee might also do that um, as well. That is interesting. I never, I never thought of cinnamon as chocolate enhancer, but it totally makes sense because for, for Mexican hot chocolate, they do add in cinnamon and I always find it more delicious. And for me, I especially love cinnamon. So even the recipe called for, um, let's see how much they call for. So the recipe called for one half tablespoon of cinnamon. I actually add a little bit more than half a tablespoon of cinnamon because I want to really taste that cinnamon flavor. All right, it seems like our mixture are pretty well mixed. I don't want to over mix this. So I will start transferring this to um, the baking pan. So I have a nice tam five inch baking pan and then I spray it with a little bit of cooking oil. And it's gonna look like this. So now I just transfer everything. You are you adding the chocolate chips? Yes, did I already? did. Oh, you did, I didn't see that, okay. Yeah, it's right. Okay, <laughs> right here. I'm not <laughs> sure you can see that, but <laughs> I will that. never forget anything chocolate. This sounds a little loud. Let me use this. It's a great way to scrape everything from the bowl. I think this would be nice for Easter too. I think a lot of people do carrot cake on Easter. You could do zucchini cake on Easter as well. Yeah. You can impress your guests with how much fiber you can incorporate in your sweet. And can you not, they, they're not gonna taste it. I was just thinking what they, fun they just gonna be like, what is this crunchy texture? <laughs> so, Try to even this out a little bit. And this is what it's look like. So I don't have access to my kitchen right now. So I do this little visually. So you preheat your oven to 350 degrees Fahrenheit. And then when the preheat is done, you put this into your oven. And since this one have zucchini, um, the mixture are much more moist than regular baking mixture. So you might need a little bit of extra time of baking. So I would say 50 to 55 minutes in the oven. Because the other day I put this in the oven, I come back and check around um, around after 40 minutes. I use a chopstick to, to check like the surface. And at 40 minutes, it is still very liquidy, especially in the middle of the cake. So I leave it for about 15 more minutes. And then when I come back, it's, it's all nicely baked. So don't get freaked out if it's look super liquidy in the middle because after 50 or 55 minutes, it should be good. So I did make another cake yesterday and then I would like to show you. Put this knife away. So this is supposed to go into the oven. Right here, I have a little plate. And this is what I got. So it looks super chocolatey. 
um, my hands is clean, so I just want to demo the texture. It's this very firm. When you pressed it, it doesn't have a spongy feel like regular cake. It's because it's really dense, especially from the grated zucchini. So it's really firm. <laughs> now let me show you how the cuts look. Here. Is that a little carrot top on top? Sorry? Did you decorate it with a little carrot top? Um, my my mom grilled this plants. I, I don't really know which one is it, but <laughs> it's look nice for decoration. <laughs> so is hat is is it's a hard kick, really dense. And I guess it's from how much is how much fiber is have inside. So this thing is twisting. So here it is. This is the inside. So you can see that it's really dense. And it's this full of zucchini, I can tell. I wish everyone can taste this, but it's really delicious. I I pinch a little corner and it tastes very chocolatey and I can feel the crunch of the zucchini. So you can definitely feel like you eating this cake and then you get somewhat more fiber than a regular cake. So yeah, check out the recipe for this chocolate zucchini cake as well as the black beans quinoa in the soup. And then I hope you can serve your fam your family a whole vegetarian cooking meal maybe sometime in the future and i hope you enjoy all of our cooking demos today and thank you for attending thank you too that, that zucchini bread looked absolutely amazing and delicious um, thank I you i just wanted to remind everybody before we go this was the last in our spring series um, spring series, um, spring series, um, spring series. Sorry about I'm that. Sorry. <laughs> I, I quit. I, I just try to turn out my demo. Thank you. Um, this is the last of our of our six Zoom sessions planned. We are looking at a date later in May where we will be talking about nutrition and aging. Um, so stay tuned for more on that. And um, we hope to see you all again. And thank you so much for joining us. Thank, Thank you for you. hosting this. We learned a lot. Very good. Like some tips and some things. We're going to go give a shot after this. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Please try the, make the cake for Easter. Thank you, everyone. We've really enjoyed these sessions with you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you.